everybody. This is Bob Tigenhoff. I'm the director of the Center for Active Lifestyle Medicine at the Integrative Medical Group of Irvine in Irvine, California. We're going to be talking today about bisphenol A, BPA, in just a minute. Uh, I want to remind you that tomorrow at uh, four o'clock West Coast time, Pacific Standard Time, we will be talking about not getting stuck with nonstick cookware. We'll be talking about um, the chemicals involved in the manufacture and the uh, use of nonstick cookware, whether or not it poses a significant risk. And if so, then what can you do to prevent, uh, to protect yourself against that? And how can you say stay, stay safe when you have those kinds of exposures? So we'll be talking about that uh, tomorrow again at four o'clock Pacific time. Today, we're gonna to be talking about bisphenol A, BPA. Uh, we're, we'll talk about how we get exposed to it. Exa well, exactly what it is, number one, how we get exposed to it. Is that exposure something to be concerned and worried about? And if it is, in fact, then what do we do to protect ourselves from it and uh, minimize our exposures uh, to this chemical. First off, what is BPA? BPA is a synthetic estrogen uh, uh, that was initially developed back in 1891. So it's been around for over 100 years. In the 1930s, a great deal of interest was focused on BPA because it was believed at that time that with a little bit of work, it could become, in fact, the first birth control pill because of its very heavy estrogen effects. It lost out to an alternative drug called DES, diethylstilbestrol, which ultimately proved to be one of the most disastrous uh, pharmaceuticals ever to hit the market. And you may have heard of DES daughters and DES sons that's the result of that line of research. Fortunately, bisphenol A didn't end up there. Instead, it ended up as a component in a number of different plastic products that are made. One of those plastics um, is polycarbonate. It is typically clear plastic, but it has a very rigid structure, and it's the bisphenol A that gives it that rigid structure. It, uh, for years and years, was used in water bottles, was used in the original um, quart-sized and uh, liter-sized soda bottles. Um, it was used in baby bottles. It was used in sippy cups and a whole variety of different types of products. Polycarbonate's also used in shock-resistant plastic applications. It's used in a lot of toys that uh, young children suck on uh, and get exposed that way. Um, it's also used in epoxy resins. Now, epoxy resins um, are used primarily today in the lining of tin cans that are used in food and beverage instances. So there was a time not too, too long ago when virtually all of the food cans in the grocery store had a lining, a, an epoxy lining, that contained BPA and unfortunately the BPA leaches out of that and into the food product. So how we get exposed to these? Uh, we get exposed to them through products like water bottles. We get exposed to them through the food we eat and that's probably the primary exposure level. It comes from the cans. And a third route of exposure is BPA is often used in thermal printing paper. Where, does, where do we see that? Well, every cash register that you go to in the modern, uh, in, in most stores today, uh, it, they're gonna hand you a receipt at the end of the transaction. And you've probably noticed, um, not so much today, but the first time you got it, it was awfully slippery, it had this funny kind of texture to it. And that's largely a result of the BPA that's used in those, um, in those uh, receipts. They're also, it also shows up in airline boarding passes. Um, one of the things that we've seen is uh, there was a recent study done of McDonald's uh, K-12 
cashiers. And these people, of course, are uh, ringing up the orders and tearing off the cash receipts all day long, handing them to people. And they found that those people in particular had extremely high levels of BPA in their systems and in their urine, which is typically where you uh, test to see if there is exposure. It's not believed, although it's still open to question, it's not believed that um, you get exposure so much through your skin as probably the assumption that was made is that these people go ahead, get a very, very thick layer of BPA on their hands, and then they go eat. Now, if they're eating a hamburger or something like that, that they're handling with their, with their hands and they haven't washed their hands first, then of course they're going to end up ingesting a very significant amount of BPA along with that. Whatever the mechanism, somehow it's happening and these people are getting very, very large exposures and doses of BPA on a daily basis. How significant is that risk? Um, the, there is some widespread concurrence between the National Toxicology Program, which is a division of the National Institutes of Health that looks at potentially toxic chemical exposures. The EPA, which is independent from the uh, National Institutes of Health, and the World Health Organization has also chimed in on this as well. Uh, they all look at BPA exposure as being perhaps most of most concern when it comes to very young children, both um, as fetuses before they're born and as the they're undergoing very rapid cell division within the within the womb and as the endocrine system itself is being programmed and trained in order uh, to function in a normal fashion. Um, and during the early developmental years when, again, a lot of the, um, uh, the hormonal transactions taking place is being established, how hormones uh, are accepted by and uh, are trans their actions and their messages are translated by the hormone receptors. And in fact, it seems that it's the receptors more so than the hormones themselves that are being affected by the BPA. Um, I, I mentioned that it's of most concern when it comes to the very young. When it comes to adolescence, there is a little bit lesser, but still something of a concern that it leads to premature puberty, particularly in girls. And when it comes to adults, the, uh, the consensus within that entire group is to say that probably negligible impact and there, there isn't a great deal of concern. Consequently, the, in the United States at any rate, we can use BPA in virtually anything, except for the fact that back in 2012, or, uh, 2012 the, um, the FDA did in fact bar BPA from being used in products that babies would be using, primarily baby bottles and sippy cups. Um, there is some disagreement, however, the, in the European Union, there is a great deal of focus now being placed on endocrine disruptors in the environment. And so BPA has been under a, a great deal of scrutiny and its use and utilization has been limited in many ways, uh, less less so in the United States, although we're now starting to see a lot of research coming out indicating that perhaps BPA plays a dominant uh, role in the development of a condition called polycystic ovary syndrome in which women um, are exposed, who are exposed to BPA in utero while they're developed, while the fetus is developing in the womb, they have a misprogramming take place of the estrogen and the estrogen receptor signaling system. And consequently, they, um, they suffer much higher rates of infertility. They suffer um, typically much higher rates of obesity, insulin resistance, uh, hair loss, scalp hair loss. Um, they have excessive hair on their bodies. So um, 
again, that's one of the characteristics of PCOS. It's the uh, greatest endocrinopathy problem of the endocrine system in women today. It's been estimated as many as 25% of all women worldwide experience um, symptoms of, of PCOS in, to one degree or another. So it is a serious problem. Uh, we think that there is, again, research that would indicate that very, very minimal, small levels of BPA exposure have very profound effects. In fact, we know that as the fetus, as the fetal tissue is uh, dividing and uh, taking on the characteristics of the different types of cells in the body, that the concentration of chemical needed to change a cell from one type to another is really in the parts per billion. One part per billion, one to four maybe parts per billion, will be enough of a, of a chemical um, um, environment to actually cause cells to change and radically change. Um, the environmental working group that we've talked about several times in this series, they did a study back in 2009 in which they looked at uh, fetal or placental cord blood and they found BPA circulating in nine out of 10 of the, uh, the, uh, the placentas basically that they analyzed and, and uh, sent off to the labs. So we know that, that there is that exposure in the fetal environment. Uh, we're not entirely sure what it does, but it, there is a very good chance that it is a major contributor. What we also don't know is we don't know what its effect is once it's combined with any of the dozens of other types of endocrine disrupt, disrupt and chemicals that are freely uh, uh, dispersed in our environment and which, again, these fetuses come into contact with through the, the exposure of the mother. So there are risks with BPA. Um, we know that BPA leads, uh, 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 that BPA exposure has been linked to infertility issues. It's been linked to obesity. It's been linked to a variety of cancers, prostate cancer, breast cancer, um, heart disease, hypertension, <clears throat> atherosclerosis, and again, insulin resistance, um, and diabetes, type 2 diabetes primarily. So what can you do in order to minimize your exposure? Because even though we don't have a really good handle on exactly what an acceptable exposure level is, we know that given the exposures we have to all of these other endocrine disrupting chemicals, and there have basically never been a study on what is the consequence of multiple exposures to all these different chemicals are, we simply don't know what it is. Um, so it seems that a perhaps a wise precautionary approach would be to do whatever you can to minimize your exposure to as many of these chemicals as you possibly can. So since we're talking about BPA, what do you do when it comes to that? Well, number one, you can eliminate a lot of your exposure because we know it comes from the food supply and, and through eating. You can eliminate uh, buying canned goods from manufacturers who still use BPA in the, line, in the epoxy lining of their cans. Uh, the Environmental Working Group has a uh, database that they keep on their website. It was put together in 2014, so it's a couple of years old now. And so I think probably there are manufacturers listed who have BPA in their cans uh, who probably have changed since then. Fortunately, there is a way of getting an update on that. We talked about the cell phone app, Healthy Living, that uh, is free. You can get it at, the, uh, at Google Play or the App Store uh, for iPhones. And when you look up a food item or you scan its uh, universal product code, it will show you whether it, it will give you a, a reading of its, um, of its rating. And within that, it will tell you whether or not the cans that, um, 
that the food is in contain BPA or not, and you can make your decision that way. Uh, when you're buying foods that have that are come in plastic containers, you can look for that number seven in the triangle, the recycling triangle on the bottom. Um, I don't personally buy many products at all in plastic cans, but when I or plastic bottles, but when I do, I always look to see what uh, what kind of plastic they happen to be in. Um, generally speaking, the safer plastics are two, four, and five. And the other ones for a variety of different reasons, because not only BPA and, and number seven, but there are some other pretty nasty chemicals and some of the other coded uh, groupings that you want to avoid. So again, the safe ones are two, four, and five. If you see the seven, it's a pretty good indicator that, uh, that the product contains BPA and you probably want to stay away from it. Uh, another thing that you can do uh, way to stay uh, safe is make sure that any of the plastic containers that you have, um, they be, they, um, they will um, exp express and allow BPA out into the environment and into any food they have. That characteristic increases under heat. So number one, I don't want to heat things up in the microwave oven because it's simply going to release much, much more BPA into the, any food that's in that container while it's being heated. But a second thing is we find that when they are washed in dishwashers under high heat, that they become, um, they start releasing more and more of the BPA. The BPA will, will break down and it's released into the food after it's washed and subsequently used. When those, when those plastic um, uh, containers are damaged in any way, they're cut with a knife, they crack, whatever, then some of the inside surfaces that have, uh, that have seen less of their BPA escape over time, they now come in contact with food and you have a higher rate of uh, contamination from BPA in those sorts of, of instances. You want to avoid handling paper receipts, airline tickets, things like that. Now with the airline, if you have an, a smartphone, a good strategy is to learn how to use the Apple wallet or the equivalent in the, uh, the Android so that you can have your, your boarding pass uh, there on the iPhone and you don't even have to deal with the, uh, with the thermal printed boarding passes. When it comes to the grocery store, you can either, uh, if, if you're paying cash and you don't need it as a proof of receipt or anything, then um, you can choose either, no, thank you, I don't want it, you can keep it, throw it away, or you can have the, um, uh, the cashier put it in the bag and then um, use it minimally, touch it minimally when, you, uh, when you're in your own home um, I don't save those for any reason. Um, so I typically will just tell them, no, you can keep it and that's fine. What you also want to make sure of is you don't give them to your children to play. Uh, children, by the way, have much higher rates, uh, concentrations of BPA in their bodies than do adults. And so you want to keep these things away from children as much, much as possible. Now there's one, um, one other way that um, that you can become um, exposed to this, and this is um, through dental sealants. A lot of the dental sealants are made with BPA. And so given a choice, uh, when you go to the dentist, you might decide that that's not a good option for your kids and you'll just have to stay on top of them to brush their teeth a little bit more frequently than um, than they otherwise would have to if they have these sealants because they're they're simply uh, swallowing BPA all day long when uh, when that happens. So these are the ways that you can uh, identify your BPA exposures. You can hopefully limit your BPA exposures and take one more step in the in the journey to being safe in an unsafe world. 
I thank you for joining me tonight, and hopefully I'll see you again tomorrow at four o'clock when we'll be talking about nonstick cookware and how to stay um, safe and use that confident, confidently or find good alternatives to it. Um, and again, staying safe in an unsafe world. Thank you very much. Good night.